Are you ready to make the most of your oil and gas mineral rights? Welcome to the Mineral Rights Podcast. Get the knowledge and resources you need to manage your minerals and royalties. Here is your host, Matt Sands. Hello and welcome to the Mineral Rights Podcast. I'm your host, Matt Sands, and I'm here to help you make the most of your minerals and royalties. I, uh, first of all, hope that all of you are well in these extremely challenging times that we're faced with. These recent challenges to our economy, uh, the potential challenge to our health, both physical and mental, really highlight the need to focus on things that are important, like our health and our families. And for all of you that also work in the oil and gas industry or within minerals and royalties specifically, there is even more uncertainty with the recent crash in oil prices. And there's uncertainty around what the oil and gas business will look like a month from now or six months from now or even a year or two in the future. But one thing is for certain after focusing on the important things, like whether or not there is enough toilet paper in the house, or on a more serious note, making sure the kids are actually being productive and doing their schoolwork while we're all at home together for potentially the first time where parents are working from home and and kids are home with schools closed. And in those difficult situations, there's a lot of distractions, and we really have to refocus our attention on getting things done. Uh, In times of uncertainty, I know that having a mission or a purpose can be helpful in uh, getting through these tough times. And so we still need to be aware of what's going on around us, but that purpose in life that we have and that mission can help us focus on getting the things done that need to be done and providing value to those around us, both in our professional lives and also in our personal lives. And If you share this feeling, then I think you'll really get a lot of value out of today's episode. There's still a lot of opportunities in the minerals market. In fact, I would say that there is even more opportunity now than before the crash of the the oil prices. And um, that being said, in a time of low oil and gas price, it's even more important to be as efficient and effective as possible in order to stay in business, frankly. And... Specifically, this might look like companies needing to increase productivity, to lower cost, and to be even more nimble to be able to respond to the quickly changing market conditions, which I think is is putting it lightly, given the uh, big swings in the financial markets and the price of commodities. And in this episode, we're going to cover some ways that you might be able to help your company reduce cost, increase productivity, when you run title. And Justin and I talk with Ashley Gilmore, the co-founder of Tracks.co, whose revolutionary approach to running title has helped companies both large and small streamline that process. In fact, their tagline is to run title at half the cost and twice the speed. Ashley is the co-founder of Tracks, like I mentioned, where he applies his background in launching and managing startup companies And he draws upon his extensive knowledge of oil and gas law and information technology. Gilmore pioneered a new approach to running title in the oil and gas industry, which led to the inception of Tracks.co. Prior to Tracks, Gilmore founded FileNile, Mavbot, and CloudPower. And he's also been awarded two patents. So I'm really excited to dive into how to streamline how you run title. Without further ado, here's Ashley Gilmore with Tracks.co. Really excited to have you on the show, Ashley. This is definitely one of the most anticipated episodes, at least from my standpoint. I know that you and I have been going back and forth for maybe over a year now. I can't remember exactly when we first spoke about you coming on the show, but I'm I'm glad we were able to finally have you on. Yeah, thanks for having me, Matt and uh, Justin. It's, It's great to be here. I'm glad we can do it. Uh, it looks like your uh, show has got some really cool episodes recently, so hopefully this one keeps your audience entertained. For sure. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure it will. So let's go ahead and dive in, and um, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your background and how you ended up landing in oil and gas industry? Yeah, so my father was in oil and gas uh, my entire life. He is a geophysicist that graduated from Colorado School of Mines. 
and uh, was originally from Washington. My mom's also from Washington State, but uh, when he graduated from Mines, he got a job down in Texas. And so uh, he eventually had myself <laughs> and my sisters and brothers. And um, so I kind of grew up around oil and gas. But after he retired, we moved to the Seattle area where I met my co-founder, David Dewey, who's a computer scientist, savant, uh, essentially. He's been coding since, you know, even before high school. We've been working together ever since. We started up this company called Cloud Power. And Cloud Power essentially uh, helped companies go paperless, use enterprise content management, and then eventually shifted them to cloud. So we made the decision to exit that company. And when we exited, I followed a plan to go to law school. Uh, that I'd always, you know, kind of had a passion and goal of achieving. And while I was in law school, I decided that oil and gas law might be something I was interested in. And so I asked actually my dad what the, the best way into oil and gas law would be. And he said the fastest way he could think of was through title work. And so I ended up in a courthouse, uh, my first, you know, 1L year of law school. Very interesting. And in, in that process, um, you, you're getting into running title, I guess, and, and looking at title opinions and so forth. How did that progress into deciding to start tracks? What was the need that you saw there? Yeah. So the first year, my 1L year, I was actually going to be working for Richard the Guard, actually, and wasn't going to be related to title at all. But that fell through basically last minute. And so ended up, you know, talking to the VP of land over at Crimson, where John Cochran was working. And he uh, talked to one of his brokers about getting me in the courthouse. And so he got me in the courthouse shadowing a landman. And that landman uh, pulled out a stack of note cards on my first day. And he started shifting through them, trying to figure out where he had left off. And, you know, he had a yellow legal pad with him. And I didn't see I don't think he had a laptop with him. I'm pretty sure he just had those note cards. And I just, you know, for me, I was like, I could not believe that this guy was getting paid hundreds of dollars per day to use note cards in a courthouse pulling documents. And so it kind of uncovered a, what I thought could be a major opportunity. So I went back uh, to law school after that experience, and I took every course I could on oil and gas law and uh, learned about title. And eventually, John Cochran scored me a job as a 2L intern. And that's where I got exposed to title opinions, like you just mentioned. And looking at those uh, title opinions, you know, I thought certainly, you know, they're charging hundreds of dollars per hour. That there's a better way than what I saw in the courthouse. And we were certain that we could build this thing. So we ultimately, I went back to law school. Uh, we raised a small friends and family round. You know, you, it, back then it was like Christmas every couple hours because every time I would ask for something, David would be able to iterate it into the platform and all of a sudden it would do something something amazing that I couldn't do a minute before. That's very cool. That sounds like a really fun experience. I know I've worked for in, in a large corporate environment and just trying to develop what would seem to be a, a simple application or something relatively straightforward and not having the coder there sitting next to you saying, hey, is this what you meant? You know, and being able to iterate very quickly that way can can be a very painful experience, but doesn't sound like that was the, the case in, with David. So that's cool. Yeah, with David, David is, like I said, a savant. You can literally just, if you, if, you know, sometimes I think the reason we're such a successful team is he is the best coder you can hope to hire. There isn't any tech company out there that wouldn't hire David, right? And and then there's me, and I know just enough that I don't know what isn't possible. And so when I ask or think it's always like slightly beyond what most people think is possible, and then he could still work on it and somehow, uh, you know, all of a sudden we can compute mineral ownership and no one else can. Absolutely. Well, what a great relationship. And kind of getting into the nitty gritty of tracks here, but... I know many of our listeners are familiar with how to run title, uh, but for those uh, that are new to running title, what does running title look like without tracks in their world? Yeah, it's really uh, you know county specific, but the general principles are the same. Uh, you have uh, 
essentially documents that represent a chain of title and those documents are stored in a courthouse whether that be online or, or not online and those documents can be located using an index and sometimes the index is based on a track book so you know all of the documents that are involved in that tracks chain of title and tract is um, a space of land or a mineral tract is different than this but essentially you know the simplest way to say it is that uh, a tract is just an area of land that you hope to run the title on in this situation we can get more into the specific legal des descriptions of what a tract is if, if you want to but uh, when you've identified that tract and there is a track book you can just process all of the documents within that book and get to to f determine who all the owners are if you're in you know texas in most counties it's by grantee or grantor so you quite literally look at who the surface owner is and you uh, you find a deed that grants them the surface and then you you chain that backwards by finding uh, where the uh, grantor was a grantee and you keep doing that back and forth until you get to the sovereignty or the the government that originally owned the the property um, there's some more nuances in, in there about you know identifying where the severances were from the surface and the, and the minerals but um, generally the process of running title follows one of those two paths either you're using a track book and and identifying all of the documents or you're using a grantee grantor index and finding all the documents once you have the documents you have to interpret those documents and it, it's not as easy as you might think so reading a document uh, as a lawyer you're told to always read agreements within the four corners and running title if it was that simple would be very easy which is why tracks is so helpful actually we enable the the interpreter or the the landman to just focus on the four corners of that one instrument so if, you know if the deed is saying i'm giving all right title and interest to party b well in order to compute the ownership you need to know what party a has before that transaction and what party b has before that transaction and then you need to know what they have afterwards but when you look at the document it seems really simple so chaining title involves doing these small computations but in the aggregate can become uh, quite large and quite difficult absolutely i think running title is uh not the favorite thing of a lot of people to do i i'm personally not a fan myself <laughs> I bring several uh, landmen with me whenever uh, I get in a situation where I have to run title. You know, when you do that interpretation, I mean, is that going into like an Excel spreadsheet typically, and then you're relying on that person to key in the right formulas? That's kind of been my experience. Is that sort of what you're you're seeing, you know, in the absence of tracks? Yeah. So it's large. you use a note card and the note card says party A to party B, half my interest. And the next note card says party A to party C, my other half of my interest. And then the next document says B and C, all of my interest to party D. And, you know, they're literally writing down these formulas over and over again on usually like butcher paper or legal pads. And then, you know, in some cases, people are using some really, um, really big Excel spreadsheets to do this. And, and if they fat finger it or they mess it up, uh, then the calculation at the end is going to be wrong. And there's no indication that something's been typed in wrong necessarily. So right now, I, you know, I honestly, I, I have a huge amount of respect for anyone that gets to a right answer that's doing it manually. Mm, yeah. So if you've painted the picture, definitely a, a big need for something to solve this problem. Now, tell me how tracks does solve the problem you know what what does the process look like with tracks and why is it better yeah so with tracks we've created a digital note card and uh, the landman gets into tracks whether they're working for a mineral buyer or an emt company and they uh, start chaining title just as if they were doing it the old way so they pull out their digital note card in this case and they pull the first document when they pull the first document the major difference is our note card is really thoughtful and it captures only the necessary data and then the system in the background is instantly calculating the effect of that on everything else and so as they add documents they're only having to type in what that document says so party a to b half my interest party b to c half my interest party c to d e and f you know one third e and then all of a sudden you find out that party a conveyed to 
party Q before he conveyed to party B. And so the, the interest is actually different. Um, with tracks, you're just keying in what the four corners of that instrument is. We want the landman doing zero math in the field. So in the actual conveyance section, it's, it's funny because you can type in there, uh, you can use the original legalese like we talked about before. So one third of one eighth plus one fourth of one sixth, and it will calculate that. Um, you can use net acres, whole numbers, fractions, or decimal points. Whatever the document says, it's what you're putting in that field. And then it's instantly calculating the, you know, the effect of that document on all the other documents in the chain of title. And when it does that, it automatically generates all of the reports. So we have had clients say that track saves two to three weeks on every four week project in the Permian simply because of reporting. You no longer have to create ownership reports because it's created every time you add a new document. You no longer have to create flow charts because it's updated every time you change a variable. The run sheet's there. Basically, any report you'd ever want a landman to generate just, you know, from title is, is right there in tracks and automatically generated. And, you know, there's a lot of land management applications out there. What is it about tracks? Is it that the process of them being able to put it in as the document and tracking it all the way through? Is that what makes tracks unique? The computation engine and the interpretation library have not been duplicated by any system. We don't purport to be a land management system at all. We think there's a new class and that's title management. We are tracking the interest automatically. So uh, that difference is, for, for instance, I've, there is no other land management tool where you can add fractional interest. Like say you give someone an executive interest and that gets busted up and then they do an of 88s grant and and uh, or you have an NPRI of 88s so that's granted, and then it instantly calculates the net effect of that all the way to current date, right? So land management tools are really good at taking the answers that we, you know, they essentially pick up where we leave off. The second component is because you don't have a computation engine in any of these other platforms, you don't have an interpretation library. And that's the second coolest thing about tracks. In the powder right now, for instance, we have a client that's running blanket title across the powder. And they've essentially, by using tracks, have been able to leverage a 75% decrease in cost. But actually, once we release the interpretation library, that the cost for them to run title is now about 18% of their closest competitor not using tracks. And the reason is, on a track-by-track -track basis, there's about 30% common title. So... When you're using tracks and you are running title using the same indexes that you'd be using anyway, tracks picks up on the fact that that document has not only been seen before, but it's been interpreted. And so it actually is, you're not doing a search against an index or anything in tracks. You're, we're not changing any steps, but tracks is actually doing a search in the background without even you asking it to do that search and saying, okay, wait a second. This document has been reviewed before or it has been inputted before. Is this the document you want to bring into the chain of title? And it already has all the data stored in machine readable format so that it can just be dropped right into right into the new chain of title without wasting any of the, the person's time. So the two differentiators for us are the computation engine, and we have a patent on one, and uh, the interpretation library. No, that's that's beautiful and hugely valuable. I can see why that's a huge differentiator. Yeah, and I think to your point, if you run across those common documents, typically you're still having to go through the same steps if you're running title in a on a note card or an Excel. So that that is a pretty impressive opportunity, I think, like you said, to to streamline the process. Can you talk a little bit about the efficiencies related to that single data entry? You meant you mentioned the the note card within tracks that you input the necessary data and then how that is then gone through the, the whole calculations and then the reports that are available. What kind of reports does tracks have built in? Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. So um, I'll answer the report question first and then answer that first question. The report question. So we do a history of title, which is basically a summary of all the documents that are conveying a mineral interest. We do an assignment of leases report, which is an analysis of all the assignments within the chain of title that are assigning a leasehold interest. 
And then we do a lease analysis report, which is an analysis of all the active leases in the train of title. And then uh, we have a lease ownership report, which is an, a report that a lot of mineral buyers use. Uh, it separates the ownership in a way that makes it easy to see who owns what working interest in using which leases, right? Then we have an ownership report, which is more like uh, the report an EMP company is used to seeing. Uh, so it's broken out into, you know, working interests, MPRIs, you know, royalty. Um, so it's just, it's actually multiple reports nested into one. And then we have the flat ownership report, which uh, essentially is an export of all relevant data points within the system that can be, you can run a robot on or a script on to populate any of your Salesforce or land management platforms. Uh, then we have, or you can just filter to do any search you want. Then you have the interpretation library itself, which you can search anywhere uh, for any document in the platform, uh, which can, you know, you can see essentially in this situation, um, like as an example, a run sheet, right? So we probably have one of the best, well, we do have the best run sheet I've seen uh, just because it can be filtered by so many different things that are relevant to title that you can't do unless you're computing against it. So all the flag documents, all of the all of the warnings, any of the assumptions that you had to create in title, you can filter by notes, you can filter by basically any data point within the note cards themselves rather than just the run sheet. It's also a management tool in that it allows you to communicate with other people that are reviewing the title. Then we have a requirements report, which is just a summary of all the documents that have requirements in them. And then we have the stats report, which tells you the number of documents that you have um, of each of each primary type. So there are four primary types of documents. You have conveying documents, which we just described as mineral conveyances. You have leases, which create the leasehold. You have assignments, which assign a leasehold interest. And then you have non-conveying documents like deeds of trust or mortgages, et cetera. And um, so it tells you all of those. And then it also gives you a really unique metric. A lot of times people will say, well, this is really hard title. And that is possible. Um, it is possible that the stat could be misleading, but usually it's not. So, And that's the total computations required to get to the answer. If you were to do the math perfectly as a human without making a single mistake, how many math equations would you have had to do? The lower that number, the uh, simpler the title. The higher that number uh, is the more complex and likely the longer it took to, to chain it out. We have uh, a couple acre tracks in the Permian that have over a million computations. And then finally, uh, there's the warnings report. And that's a report that's auto-generated by tracks and it detects any over conveyances or duplication and entries. And it flags not only the the flow chart, but it also flags in this warning report so that you can actually, whenever you're reviewing the title, you can go straight to the documents where an over conveyance might have happened or there might be some cloudy title issue and, and get straight to the problem issues. And then finally, I guess, not really report, but the flow chart, you can export that in a printable format or an SVG that can be blown up into any size. What was your first question? Um, so that was basically the, the gist of it was, you know, the reporting and, you know, in, inputting the data once and then being able to view that information in, in different ways in an automated fashion, like you'd mentioned. So I think that that definitely answered it. I guess one other related question. So if, you know, you have a customer and they really wanted to see it in an Excel spreadsheet, is that something you can export the data in, in Excel and then manipulate it outside of tracks as well? Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, you know, a lot of legacy companies would prefer you not to export. Right now, at least, we want you to be able to do whatever you want with your data. You can export it in any way you want to um, and do whatever you want to, you know, outside of track. So you can export the things that are usable in Excel and Excel. The other ones are in Word documents um, so that you can edit those. And you can print some of the reports to PDF. So absolutely all of it can be exported. You can even export the JSON files related to the the chain of title and then use that JSON file in the future if you want to in tracks. You wouldn't be able to use it anywhere else, but unless somebody else came up with a computation engine that could interpret the JSON file. Hmm. Absolutely anything can be exported. Very cool. 
Now, I know with Excel when, in trying to track the bundle of sticks, you know, that you always hear about. So you have the executive rights, for example, the bonus and rental and the, you know, royalty rights. And I know if there's like an MPRI that's been carved out, that's always been problematic in my mind to try to track that, you know, how does track solve the problem of separating those different rights and, and tracking those and how it all fits together? Is, is that part of that the computation engine that you mentioned? Yeah, and it's what no one else has been able to crack is the tied and, and merged, you know, um, rights essentially. So how do you using Excel? A number looks like any other number, and so if you have somebody has a ten percent royalty and a ten percent executive, you might assume that those two numbers are related to each other, and when in reality that executive interest could be tied to somebody else's royalty altogether. So maybe those aren't merged, and so. At Trax, we've used a bunch of different concepts to, you know, to essentially solve that problem, and that's what our our patent is on. But essentially, you have to understand where these rights intersect and where they break apart, and uh, and why that's important is if you have an executive right or an MPRI, uh, you want the user to just be able to type in, you know, I'm conveying a naked royalty or an MPRI. I'm, I'm conveying, you know, five percent royalty to my son or fifty percent royalty to my son. But I don't trust that my son will take good lease terms. So then he or she holds on to the executive uh, rights and and eventually dies. But the the you know he's got a wife who's now has the right to part of that executive interest and uh, other siblings and then they have kids and so on and so forth. How do you know and what proportion of each of those rights ties to that royalty? With tracks, you want the user to just have to type in fifty uh, percent MPRI and then move on and tracks instantly calculates what that means to everything else right so that's a huge time savings actually for us is our ability to track and merge those rights we know exactly which executive interest is tied to all of the other rights if you can't crack that problem and you're trying to solve this title management problem it just doesn't work right because as soon as you run into an mpri what do you do and what is the typical breakdown of the types of clients that you work with? Is it ENP? Is it mineral buyers, mineral owners, or who do you guys look for? Yeah, so we we want to uh, you know focus on the people that are running the highest um, amount of title volume, but that have a similarly aligned goals. So for us, that has traditionally been ENP companies, mineral buyers, and and &E shops. And it used to be that we had uh, a lot of EMPs, but within the last year and a half, uh, it's really mineral buyers that have been driving it. Until I'd say, actually, in January of this year, we started getting a lot more traction with EMP companies. Like, uh, we just closed a couple of, uh, you know, pretty well-known, maybe publicly traded, you know, companies and uh, that are EMP shops, right? So uh, I would say it's a 50-50 blend right now between mineral buyers and EMP companies, and I'd have to go look at the numbers. Absolutely. Well, that makes sense. We, we've talked about in past shows how uh, the mineral buyers have really become such a huge um, and strong industry in and of itself. Does Trax serve the same kind of issue for all of those different types of clients? Or are different clients getting different things from Trax? I think, uh, yes, they're getting different things, but using you know the same concepts. So uh, with mineral buyers, they have a problem, right? They have a lack of opportunities that they can go pursue right and if they if an opportunity does come in the door cost leader might not title a deal that might not even happen so for us through blanket title projects and other things like that we've created a you know basically an endless source of leads that can close in a couple of days on the other side with mineral buyers the ones that are just running opportunity title we've made it so that they can spend less money and get to the answer faster right and that's super meaningful to them. A lot of the mineral buyers have, you know, their own in-house landings. So the greater the efficiency there, the better for them, right? So, um, but there's less trust issues or, or things related to you know, what might happen, say, at an EMP company. So at the EMP companies, they end up having to hire brokers out in the field. And, and title is largely a black box right now. Without tracks, it's completely dark, dark box. It's very hard to see inside and see who, how many guys do I have working here? Um, how much are they costing me? When is my project going to be completed? 
And what is it going to cost me when it is completed? Are these people actually working? And I used to be able to say that we have never deployed an enterprise um, license of tracks where we haven't uncovered lost days where people have, have overbilled. But, you know, I, I just don't know because we have a number of customers that we've deployed for and just haven't been as, as involved. But I have never personally implemented um, an iteration of the enterprise license that uses outsource lambda where we have an uncovered build days where work wasn't done. So uh, for EMP companies, they're getting transparency into the box. They can see who's working, how long it's taking. If they've done work in that area before, they start to see trends on how many documents and therefore can calculate how close they are to completion. It's not always an accurate, but law of averages. Then because of that, they can predict what it's going to cost them. So uh, that's a huge value add. Just knowing I've got 10 guys on this project, you know, eight of them showed up for work today, all on 10 tracks that we're working. We're about 50% of the way done. Took them a week to get there. So I've got another week charging 500 bucks a day. So I know approximately how much that product is going to cost me and when it's going to be done. So that's hugely valuable. Outside of that, the cost savings. So time is important also for EMP companies. They want to, you know, run the titles and they can lease it up and, and lock everything up. For tracks, we enable them to run that title 50% faster. So uh, we add we add that same value that the mineral buyers are getting. Also, accuracy. Because of the lack of fat fingering and the single entry, there's just a huge amount of benefit from using tracks for them because they're they're going to have a much more accurate answer at the end of the day. Yeah, it sounds like there's a big project management component. That, like, to your point, if you have contract landmen that are running title, that could use that in auditing the invoices you get. So that, that sounds useful as well. Absolutely. I do, land service can be such a blank check sometimes going in if you if you don't know what to expect. And is there a, a threshold that you look for with your clients? Maybe it's number of personnel, maybe it's revenue, um, or how do you how do you determine that it would be a right fit for that client? Yeah. So, and I, I love this question and everyone hates the answer. And the, the reason I love the question is because I can look you straight in the face and say, we're value-based pricing. We can sell to you if you are one person shop that does one deal a month. We have a couple of those. Or you can be Chevron or Devon or BPX or Chesapeake and have hundreds of landmen. And um, the tracks make sense because we're actually just trying to charge a percentage of the savings. And so if you're running title, uh, and maybe you're going to go into pricing, um, but I think they're, the two questions are kind of related. But if you're running title, you should be using tracks if you can get access to it. And the reason is because it makes you more efficient and you, you make less mistakes. And so we understand that not everyone is a BPX or a Chevron, but uh, we don't want to charge anyone any differently. So if you're running title and you're one guy and you're running you know, X amount of title and we can cut that in half, well, we want we want 50% of that savings. And so we just have a real conversation with all of our potential clients about what their expected projects look like for the year. And, you know, not all the time do, or do we get it right, but it doesn't matter because after the first year, we'll be able to better establish it. So we just say, you know, this is how we, we're, we're going to trust what you're saying, that you only have 10 landmen that are working currently. And we believe we can double their production. And Therefore, we're saving you, or rather increasing the number of opportunities you have, or saving you this amount of money, and we want half of that savings. Most of our customers, if you talk to some of our references, I don't know if you have, will say that we're existential to their business, meaning they could not operate without tracks at the same level, and two, that we're very expensive. Well, that's such an interesting uh, model and a kind of a divergence from the norm that you see. Um, but I love the answer. I think that's a, a wonderful way to look at it and go about it. And having that candid conversation creates such a great relationship at the start. And uh, kind of on that note, what is your favorite story that's a success story from your clients? That's a great question. So I love doing these pilots for new potential clients and uncovering uh, lost days because for me, it just speaks to how much of a need there is. So by lost day, I just mean someone overbilling. And there's been numerous cases that I can point to where it's just a huge, like we had one case where 
took them four days to do the project using tracks and they billed 14. So the client ended up getting returned, uh, you know, a nine day refund. That was pretty awesome. We also just completed a pilot that I posted about on LinkedIn. That was a shorter pilot than I usually like, but it was still awesome, an awesome result. You know, it was a 60% reduction. I like it whenever um, we get to point very specific measurable improvements. And so in that case, they knew exactly how much they'd paid for what work. And so then we were able to just redo that work in, uh, you know, 40% of the time, right? So it was a 60% reduction. So every time we get those savings and obviously that project in the powder is amazing. We have another client that scaled up from zero to 35 internal landmen essentially overnight and they are doing staggering work. And it's, it's literally, if you could see their operations, it's amazing. And a lot of it's powered by tracks. So I guess uh, the answer to your question is not, no one story, but there's just a lot of good stories because the space has been, you know, just hasn't, there hasn't been a lot of innovation. Absolutely. One, what a wonderful feeling, I'm sure, knowing that what you're putting out there is, is helping them and giving them that instant savings. And so I just have a couple of additional questions before we wrap up. Ashley, can you tell us a little bit about what's next for Trax and what's your ultimate vision for the company? So um, what's next for Trax? I was just talking to our director of software and also our CTO. And these, you know, developers, they're not very good at, you know, estimating how long something's going to take usually. And so it's very hard to get them excited. And I was just having a conversation with them about this coming year. And according to Lynn Crescetto, our director of software, that uh, we're going to have an explosion of new features released this year. So all of our existing clients will have access to our API for a nominal increase. Uh, so before that comes out, I encourage everyone to sign up because the API basically will enable you to have superpowers over your competitors uh, with the tracks data set. That's going to be amazing. Uh, we already have an internal API. We're just getting this public one released and it's set to be released in the next uh, quarter for sure. So on top of that, by the end of the year, we have a uh, full text search and some natural language processing that's going to be integrated into the app. So uh, one day you'll wake up and it will be Christmas. All of a sudden, all your documents will be searchable um, that are in track. So you'd find anything with the string P-U-G-H in it, you know, bam, you know, it won't find everything, but anything legible. And that'll just keep getting better and better. And then on top of that, we've got some really cool GIS functionality that we we actually built um, at the beginning of last year and just never released it because we couldn't fine tune it. And so as soon as this API uh, is released, we're going to be full bore on on that project. And so a ton of features coming out. Where do I see tracks? I think we're going to be, you know, hopefully able to become a platform that's necessary if you're running title. You know, we'll have our own document libraries available for people to use. Not that we currently have that in our model. Um, in fact, you know, we stay as far away as, as we can from that right now. But it would be great if we could shift from software as a service to more of data as a service in the future. And um, the the way to do that is just to continue getting good at running title and then building a land team capable of running title across the U.S. and, and, and maybe attacking that problem. I, you know, I'm not going to say for sure that's where we're going, but... Uh, I think when you start adding the GIS component, the the data extraction from the document, and you continue to improve the computation engine, we can do a lot of very in interesting things at scale that help get our customer what they want. At the end of the day, all of our customers want one thing. They want an accurate answer as fast as possible and at the most cost-effective price possible. Yeah, having that uh, the full text search capability of any uploaded documents is that's pretty exciting. I know that if you didn't flag it, there's other ways. I know in tracks you can do that, but to be able to do a a text search and it's pretty cool. So I'm I'm excited for you guys. It sounds like there's a lot of uh, really cool features that are coming up. So definitely 
this is uh, something that you're looking at, it sounds like a, a good time to check it out. I had a chance to test drive the the application and I was um, impressed and just using the, the little tutorial that you um, have with Trax University that was um, helpful in just understanding how it worked. You know, if somebody does decide that they want to look into tracks and, you know, give it a, a try, what kind of support do you offer to help onboard new clients? So absolutely. So tracks uh, university is accessible to anyone on our website, but the website is the best resource for getting the most up-to-date information. You can email me directly, Ashley at tracks.co or, um, or Paul at tracks.co is actually our director of education. So if you actually want to learn how to use tracks, reaching out to Paul Barber, it's just Paul at tracks.co. Uh, we would love to, we have no problem getting everyone on our platform to learn how to use it so that they're ready to use it in their business when they, when the time's right. We were just talking to a broker. We don't sell to brokers, but they're interested in, in getting, you know, access so that they can learn how to do it so they can have that as a competitive advantage. So it sounds like we're likely going to be training up their team so that they're ready to go. And they're going to use Trax University to do that. So um, any of your listeners, please do reach out. We'd love to get you on the platform um, and show you what Trax is all about. Our goal is to provide an ROI uh, the instant you start using Trax. So we want that month to be less expensive with the cost of Trax than it would have been without. Makes sense. It's a goal that I'd be looking at on, as an end user. So it's very good. So anything else that you want to mention that we haven't already discussed? Yeah. Um, if you're a mineral buyer or an EMP company and you're out there listening and you're becoming more of a tech company than a mineral company or an EMP company, uh, reach out. You know, it's always better to buy than build if there's a solution available. And so, uh, I've noticed a lot of our clients there, you know, they, some of them have more developers than we do. And if, if that's you, this is a really challenging problem that could take you five years to build, or you could just come, come partner with us. Sounds good. And I guess you're out on social media um, as well. Yep. We're on LinkedIn. Uh, you can find us by just looking up tracks.co. That's T R A C T S dot C O, or you can go to our website, which is just, www.tracts.co or tracks.co. And there's all kinds of information on either our website or LinkedIn. Uh, and honestly, the best way to really just get in touch is email us. And if you email us, we'll be responsive and uh, you'll find out if tracks look good for you. Well, thanks again, Ashley, for coming on the show. I appreciate your time. No, thank you, Matt and Justin. I really appreciated it. I, you know, this, this uh, just flew by. So thank you for making this all possible. Absolutely. Thanks again. Thanks, Ashley. Glad to have you. All right. I hope you enjoyed that interview with Ashley. In addition to the links that Ashley mentioned, you can go to mineralrightspodcast.com forward slash tracks, that's spelled T-R-A-C-T-S, to receive a free bonus guide that has links to Tracks University that Ashley mentioned, as well as links to their how-to guides and walkthrough videos that show you tracks in action. Of course, the best way to find out more about tracks is to reach out to their sales team and let them know you heard about them on the Mineral Rights Podcast. And in the spirit of full disclosure, if you do decide to sign up with tracks and let them know that you heard about it from the Mineral Rights Podcast, I do get a small referral commission. I wanted to be upfront with that, but it is a tool that I am currently using and learning. So hopefully this episode was helpful for you. Uh, it's definitely game changing for the way I run title for sure. And hopefully it will be a game changing for you as well. Thanks again. I appreciate you. And if you haven't done so already, please subscribe to the show because we have a lot of great content coming your way, including how you can dramatically reduce your costs around well and production data and a tool for individual mineral owners to forecast your royalty payments on your own at a fraction of the cost of hiring an expert like myself to do it for you. We also have some really useful information on how you can legally defer tax associated with the sale of an investment property and how minerals and royalties fits into this picture. 
So hit subscribe and I will see you in the next episode. Thanks so much for listening to the Mineral Rights Podcast with your host, Matt Sands. Don't forget to subscribe and share at mineralrightspodcast.com. The Mineral Rights Podcast should not be construed as investment, legal, or tax advice. All information is believed to be from reliable sources. However, we make no representation as to its completeness or accuracy.